you mentioned um, kind of having to dispel illusion and delusion to to get this view. Um, something that's a kind of a challenge with this is, as you pointed out, that in this perspective, this is the nature of the mind in every moment, right? And it's kind of deep level. It's it's the mind is already enlightened. You know, it's not something you create or you know you have this thing you might call Buddha nature. Um, and I think yeah, with with these teachings, it's it's once it's noticed, it's so obvious and simple, and it's almost like how how would they ever overlook that? It's it's the most clear, obvious. It's just like shining like a diamond, like right in the middle of every moment. But we we our minds have evolved to be these kind of distracted things, and we we don't um, notice it. So there's something I think with the um, with this tradition, it's it's great that you can simultaneously directly describe to people the nature of the mind, point it out, and for those of them who could, who just get it, great, like, and then they can return to it. But as you said, that for you there was, there was two decades of practicing, building up to this this point, and so there's this strange kind of I hesitate to say a paradox, but it's kind of like you have to, you know, it's it's right here, right now, but we're overlooking it. And so we have to do something to get back to here. You know, it's, it's kind of strange, but I think for anyone listening who, who wants to learn this, they can't just go out and do, you know, get pointing out instructions from anyone, right? It's, it's something where there are lots of preliminary practices in the Tibetan tradition. Um, and do you, do you think um, kind of, I guess, you also talk about, you know, Vipassana meditation and is that the kind of good preliminary practices, just kind of the, the more kind of widely available standard kind of meditative training before someone, you know, attempts to seek out these higher teachings? And yeah, I think it's a very nuanced question because on the one hand, as in music, there are prodigies, um, Mozart composing symphonies when he's about eight years old, something like that. Um, prodigies in music, prodigies in mathematics, prodigies in science, prodigies in chess, and so on and so on. There are simply, the, there are exceptional individuals. And from a Buddhist perspective, yeah, you'd say, yeah. It's not just their genes that make them composing symphonies when they're eight years old. Because, I, uh, you know, Mozart's parents were not geniuses. And often geniuses have pretty ordinary parents. So I don't think there's much explanatory power in trying to explain everything in terms of genes to some extent, but it really falls short. And the Buddhist view is, yeah, if you have a genius, this, can, this is good because you came in with a tremendous amount of momentum. As Plato says, you know, in his theory of reincarnation, so much we know, it's just recalling things we knew in the past or drawing from past momentum. And so in contemplative inquiry, in spirituality, there are geniuses as well, there are prodigies. And they're, they're very rare. We would, many of us would like to think we are such, but most of us aren't. I'm not. Uh, so there are individuals that they can come in with hardly any foundational training, or there are people like Jakob Böhme in the Christian tradition, who I think he was a, what's a shoemaker or something like that, a very mundane trade. But he had these natural breakthroughs. And I will not say they're equivalent to Rigpa, but clearly had some very profound breakthrough insights in nature of reality. That I take very seriously, but it wasn't coming from years and years of monastic training, contemplative training, rigorous asceticism, and so forth. So this is true. I mean, this is true in the Hindu tradition, the Buddhist, Christian, and so on. But for the rest of us who are not these, you know, one in 10 million kind of prodigies, then there is a path. There is a step-by-step -step path. And it starts, I mean, I can really make it very, very concise. It starts with ethics. With no ethics, forget about it. You know, there is no foundation without ethics. And it's fundamentally nonviolence and benevolence that we treat ourselves, other species, and the environment with, with nonviolence above all. And we're not doing that, we're doing the opposite as a civilization. And with benevolence, when we see we can be a benefit, then we do our best to do so. On that basis, then there's the training in samadhi. And this is samadhi is not just training single pointed like a single pointed attention, like a world class chess player or a sniper or a jet fighter pilot. This is the contemplatively trained deep samadhi that can be sustained single-pointedly for hours or even days on end. And no jet fighter pilot can do that. And so, and what it is is cultivating exceptional levels of mental balance, mental refinement, honing, refining, developing, and cultivating the mind so that you can use it like a laser. You start out with, in English, you say, British English, a torch. To start the torch, you can light a lantern with a torch. But seeing that, take that same kind of light and give it a lot more energy and homogenize it and tightly focus it, you got yourself a paranormal light, which you call a laser. Samadhi is a laser of consciousness. So we all have consciousness, but very few people have turned their flashlight or their torch into a laser. 
and to really have very profound and liberating, irreversibly liberating insights that radically and irreversibly transform, you can't skip samadhi. You can't have just a glimpse and have it turned into a memory and think that's gonna bring about some absolutely radical change in your whole being. So samadhi is a way of making the insights sustainable, that they actually permeate every aspect of your being. And on that basis of shamatha, which is true for all, you know, it's common, it's found in all Buddhist tradition, starting with early Buddhism, Theravada, and so forth. Then on that basis, then you have vipassana. And there's a wide variety of methods, just like you can't say, well, what's the scientific method when it comes to physics? Well, it's a bit more complicated than that. Which brands of physics, which kind of technology, and so forth. And so there's a wide variety of methods of vipassana, but, but they all entail not just bare attention. That's really dumbing it down an awful lot. It's very rigorous modes of inquiry and powered with samadhi. So like the samadhi is a telescope and Vipassana is actually conducting astronomical research. And that will give you insight into the absence, the emptiness of an inherently existent ego, separate autonomous. You'll see that for yourself. Extend it and you'll see that you have insight into the emptiness of all phenomena, which is pretty, getting pretty close to the insights of quantum mechanics, but actually experiencing it. And on the basis of those two, and then there's a crucial point that's easily left out. And it will sound like it's coming from left field. We say in baseball terminology, just out, out, of, out of the blue. But as for Dzogchen, as for all of Vajrayana, all of Mahayana practice, motivation is enormously important. Motivation. Because people can have all kinds of motivation for science, including wanting to just be wealthy or be famous or develop a weapon of mass destruction and so on. And that's true for the arts, it's true for literature, motivations differ an awful lot. But for Dzogchen, given the nature of the inquiry, the only suitable motivation is universally stated, is a motivation, the aspiration to achieve the highest possible spiritual awakening, the perfection of wisdom, of compassion, in order to be of greater service to the world. So it has to be rooted in benevolence, altruism. It's called bodhicitta, the mind of awakening, but that is crucial. That's the only motivation that's actually where the, where the, the, the foot fits the shoe, that it, it's in complete sync. So with that motivation, the samadhi, the vipassana, this marvelously benevolent motivation of altruism to achieve awakening for the benefit of all creatures, with that kind of preparation, then to be introduced to the view. And it can be by pointing out the structures, it can be verbal, but for some people, it can be anomalies, or it can be just by going deep into meditation yourself, having received the instruction, and you'll deliver it yourself, the, the, the pointing out instructions. You'll have your own internal breakthrough. And so that kind of preparation for the prodigies, simply by realizing Rikpa, this bodhicitta arises spontaneously and effortlessly. You don't need to cultivate it. Insight into emptiness of all phenomena, spontaneous. Insight into the egolessness, spontaneous. Samadhi, spontaneous, all from one. So that really is the pinnacle. But then one can say, well, then let's just all practice Dzogchen. But this would be by like taking a whole, you know, a, a group of five-year-old children who are just ready to enter, you know, kindergarten and saying, you know, the highest branch of science is quantum cosmology. And I know you don't know how to add and subtract yet, but let's just, I'm just, just teaching kids, you know, I'm just going to teach you quantum cosmology because it's the highest thing there is. Well, they'll never learn quantum cosmology and they'll never learn how to add and subtract either. And so for the prodigy, who knows, you know, there are children, what was the last one? I, a 13-year-old thing had to already earn his PhD, something like that. You know, these prodigies come up. And yeah, you know, there, there's one Indian master, Atisha, he was reading Sanskrit when he was three years old. And it's a tough language. So the prodigies, you know, they're unusual. But for the rest of us, there are these preparations so that we make ourselves ripe, or to use Buddhist terminology, we make of our minds a suitable vessel so that when presenting with the, presented with the view, the meditation, the way of life, other great perfection, it goes in, we realize it, we embody it, and we're liberated. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned the, um, the kind of cultivation of compassion as well, because I think it's... Um, you know, in the motivation to practicing this stuff, because we didn't mention before that I think that's a kind of a key aspect of the mind that's pointed out in these in, in these teachings as well. So, you know, if if in your deepest nature you you are awake or aware and have and the mind has this compassionate tone, if you're trying to get there without cultivating awareness and compassion, 
then you're just I guess you're just leaving certain blockages in the way and it's it's just not a, a wise you're not going to get there by by leaving them there I think.